Yeah, let's start up. Um, we This one's a fairly open agenda. We're just going to have an open discussion. Raise your hand, share your thoughts. Feel free. We've got our um, expert salesperson in here, George Leith. So ask any questions, what to pitch, how to pitch, share your insights, what you do. And uh, tell us how you're finding success. If you've used Real Proposal armor. Builder, or what your sales techniques are. Um, what's your biggest takeaways from the event are, what are you going to start? And it doesn't doing right register now? when you're in the morning though. Oh, Brett, you're yeah. <laughs> Brett's here organizing <laughs> some stuff. And we've also got, so we've got a couple of Vendastians in here. I see Andrew, Katrina, Brett, myself, and George. So, um, feel free to ask questions, anything about that Vendasta stuff, but I'd really take advantage of George's presence. So what did you think of the show? Fine, I'll go first then. New proposal builder. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Robert. <laughs> Thanks, Gio. I appreciate it, buddy. Um, two things I just want to comment on. First one is, you know, as, as agency owners, obviously as Vendasta partners, you know, we wear so many hats and we're juggling so many, so many balls in the air at the same time. And oftentimes it can become overwhelming. Um, and also fulfilling as well. Uh, but I think with George's presentation and often when he speaks, uh, bringing it back to the basics, keeping things simple, uh, yet meaningful, uh, are powerful messages. And sometimes I lose track of that because I'm so bogged down in the minutia of, you know, crossing every T, dotting every I, making sure everything is as perfect as it possibly can be, instead of just really trying to be very, um, I'm going to use the word organic uh, in, my, in my messaging, very purposeful. Uh, in my presentations. So I, that's, that's, that's what I took from it. And it's always good to hear him do that. The other thing I just want to comment on, uh, I don't know who the gentleman was, but they just said to George, you were at, I guess, Burrell's or someone's conference. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. That right? uh, a couple of weeks back, okay. Brendan and I were at Burrell. Okay. So you were at Burrell and I think was, there, and you, I think I also saw images on social media, you were in San Diego or something. That was a couple of weeks before that. We were at the International Franchise Show in San Diego. Okay, so then it's reasonable to assume, if I were to extrapolate from those two events, that we can maybe start thinking about getting back in person. All right, I would <laughs> I absolutely. Know where you're going, that's what I, you know, what I'm saying I'm just <laughs> got to get back in person, man. It's just, I mean, the energy, you know, online is great, but it's just, it's an entirely different, you know, you know, animal when you can actually see you know, you up on stage and, and obviously see Jeff on stage, his shirts really come to life in person. You know what I mean? Um, so let's just, let's, I don't know if it's hashtag in person, hashtag conquer local in person, something we're still trying to get to Montreal. So that's my, no, my, two, I like my that, two cents. I like that pitch, Robert. That was well done. Uh, nice segue. I will tell you that um, I've been to four conferences since COVID is officially canceled um, and they are packed like wall to wall. And the next one for our teams is the Channel Partners Expo in Vegas in two weeks. And Katrina's in the call. She's putting that together right now. We're expecting a record turnout at that to the tune of 7,000 plus. That event was, you know, sitting around five, five and a half. So definitely there's a lot of pent up demand to, to go in person. I highly recommend it. A lot of these conference organizers, they, they have their shit together where it's quite safe and they've got, you know, they're respecting the fact some people may not be comfortable, but uh, definitely it is the thing that's been missing. I spent time with our a customer of ours in South Africa last week. We've been doing, you know, probably three or four meets uh, or Microsoft Teams meetings a day with these teams. And we finally got to sit down face to face and I talked to their chief technical officer this morning and she said, we got more done in, you know, a week than we got done in two years. So that, you know, this is great that we can do virtual, but we're finding that face to face is really where the, the, the magic is again. Oh, yeah. Awesome. I think we'd all love to get back in person. Um, we'll, we'll pass it over to David. I see you've got a comment and then Patrick, but just first a quick show of hands. How many of you would come to our conference in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, central Canada? Yeah. What time of year? What season? Don't worry, Robert. We won't make you time come of year. Winter. <laughs> I don't know. We'll, we'll do it in July. I don't know. Yeah, we'll do it in know. January, 14th of January. Rates are really cheap to fly here. <laughs> Hey, I'm hey, in an RV and travel all over, so I'm there. <laughs> there we go. I'll, I'll pass it over to you, David. 
Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you, George, for that. Uh, I appreciate that. I'm also new to Vendasta. I'm with Aspen Films. And uh, yeah, George got to enjoy the local academy and the master sales series. So yeah, that, that was awesome. And this is such a, a great segue, um, I, I think, for, for after that. And so my one question, and I think as I've uh, you know been able to have a lot more calls with, with the potential clients in that, my question is, how how do you ask questions? What are some helpful open-ended questions in the initial cold call stage where it where you can get that information so that you can meet their needs, but not make it sound like you're you're selling to them? Because in a no, way, it's I love yeah, that. that's a hell of a question. I love it. <laughs> so you know the way that uh, when when I'm working with a channel partner and my my friend Bryce and I we did this years ago back in Salt Lake City. Um, when he was working for a media company, we will go on what I call four-legged call. So Bryce's two legs and my two legs. And um, we go see the customer. And we've got this beautiful snapshot report, which is needs analysis with a click of a button. But I don't think in all the time that I've had snapshot as a tool, I've ever used the entire report. I find the two or three most important pieces, and that's the stuff that we talk about. We always have the backup of the printed copy or we can give them a version of it to show the data if they wanna see the data points, but it's more around using that map. I, I call snapshot a map as to where the treasure is. So, you know, you sit down across from a customer or you're on a cold call or you're sending an email and say, I noticed uh, in doing some research around your brand that there are some discrepancies in your online listings. If you would like to learn more, I'd love to schedule a 15 minute appointment with you to discuss those. So you, you have inside that snapshot report, some challenges that you're able to see. So website is a really good example. I just actually ran one earlier today when we were working with a partner. The, the website is there, but the image on the homepage is so big that it won't load within five seconds. So then you do the outreach and you say, I've noticed that your website actually loads quite slow. I'd love to show you how you might be able to improve that experience because the data shows that if a consumer comes to a website and don't find what they're looking for within five seconds, they go to a competitor. So you use the data point and some research to back up what the snapshot report is telling you on the gap. But it's not, you notice that I'm not selling them anything. And by the way, when I'm with a salesperson that doesn't like giving away free stuff, so usually that's old salesperson like me with gray in their hair, like, oh, we don't give away anything for free. You charge for everything. It kind of goes against their being, but you got to educate them that that's not the way business is done today. We have to show value, deliver value, deliver value, deliver value, and then ask for the business. So what you're doing is you're utilizing the needs analysis. You're using, utilizing the research and the data points that we actually give you some of that on our products and services. And you're opening up a conversation with an education lens, almost like a tour guide or an educator more than a salesperson. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. That's fantastic. Awesome. Okay. We go to um, Patrick next, and then we've got a question in the chat from Johan. So we'll, we'll Patrick and, and then over to Johan. So George, uh, I think, I wondered if you could help me with this. One of my biggest problems, and I've, I've studied, you know, some story brand stuff and things like that, but it's the whole benefits versus features things. You know, one side of my brain keeps leading towards features and I got to keep pulling it back to benefits. And it's, it's really hard for me because I'm, but my daughter's in sales and she writes websites and does all kinds of stuff. And we go through this all the time. She goes, dad, you're doing it again. Go back to features, you know? <laughs> so is there anything you could talk about that kind of helps direct you towards benefits maybe and we we all make that mistake i bet you if you go back and watch the film review over the last two weeks of presentations that i've done i can get dragged into being that what i like to call a technical teller mm -hmm. and i understand our technology inside and out and i love it um and we always want to show the buttons and the whistles but what the customer really wants at the end of the day is an outcome and they want a trusted local expert to help them navigate the space so as you're building that trust by focusing on the outcome and coming back with repetition, um, it's called structured repetition. And if at the end of the day, what the customer is looking for is this desired outcome, the more times that we can articulate that, um, th that's kind of the key to it. So when what I encourage you to do is make sure you're recording your calls and you're watching your presentations, like record everything. Now I have a somewhat famous line, 
that when I watch a presentation like the one that I did today, I'll need a bottle of bourbon and a box of Kleenex because there will be drinking and I will cry. Because I'm like, why the hell am I holding my mouth that way? And why did I say that word? And why is my forehead so glistening? Um, but the only way that we get better is by watching ourselves and doing that adjudication. Now, you can have other people coach you as well. But I think what we want to stay away from is that technical teller. Um, where we get too far in the weeds. And actually what we can do is install more fear and not build trust. Like there are people that like, I'm going to show them every bell and whistle and they're going to trust me more. What actually happens is the prospect goes, wow, that shit's too hard. I'm going to go find something easier to solve my problem. So you can drag them into down a rabbit hole where that you actually confuse the customer even more. Now there's always going to be one. So if we do 10 appointments, there's going to be one that wants to know every button, every nuance. So we have to know that stuff too, but it's a very small percentage that want to go that far in my experience. Thank you. And if you're, if you're trying to define that, the, the, the need that that customer has that benefit in a way that, uh, that you could articulate to them, whether it's, you know, I, I understand, you know, it's an umbrella, it's an umbrella kind of a thing like you're using in the presentation, but, um, do you just do that with open-ended questions to try to help yourself understand what their need is? Yeah, I know. It, it really is that open-ended question. You got to get really good at answering questions. I like to also run a bit of a, an analysis on the call to say, how long was I talking? Um, so it should be two thirds and one third at the end of the day, the customer, you want them talking two thirds of the time. And the only way to get that is by asking them questions. Um, so I, I had a client the other day, we were deep into a technical discussion around how they were going to send out their bill. And the way they were billing was this really weird thing where they had five different brands and they wanted to appear in the credit card statement as five different things. I'm sitting here going, wow, um, that's a weird thing. Like it, it almost leads me to not trust the brand, right? Because when I buy something from Apple, I get an Apple thing on my credit card and then I get an invoice with the product lines. The way they were doing it was they were billing for every individual product line. I'm like, I don't even, you know, I don't even know who the hell I'm buying this from. So I then asked an open-ended question. I'm like, how did this happen? How did you guys get to this point? And they're like, oh, well, we made these decisions three years ago. We actually hate all this stuff. Um, and what I was able to determine by asking a series of questions like that, that are almost like challenger sale type questions, was I found that they convinced themselves to move to a different, you know, kind of technical solution. Because we talked to them about the technical solution we could offer, but they had this legacy thing. And um, some colleagues were like, oh, I don't really want to dig into that. What if they want it that way and we can't do it that way? And I'm like, no, ask the questions. Because a lot of times what you'll find from a customer is, you know, why is your website so slow? Why do you have that image in the front page of the website? I've actually done this question. And you'll uh -huh. have the business owner go, oh, that's my favorite picture. <laughs> We took that picture eight years ago. That's my favorite picture. That has to be on the website. I'm like, this is why your website is not getting visited and not getting clicked through is because of that old ass picture. We need to get a new picture that loads faster, but the business owner is stuck where they are and you need to give them a compelling reason why they need to change. And that's not around technology. It's more around the outcome that you're kind of trying to drive. Uh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for asking the question, Patrick. Okay, I'll go to one from the chat. Johan says, I'm new to Vendastin white, la white Labeling. Welcome. How do partners do market research to create a marketing strategy? And uh, Robert already weighed in with the snapshot report is a great piece of re place to do some research with George touched on a little bit. Does anyone in here have any other advice how you form your marketing strategy and what trends you look toward? One, I have one tip for you. Inside the business app, when you create a prospect or uh, a customer, there is a little known gold mine in there. And I wish that we paid more attention to it. And it's under the guides button in business app. And when you click on guides, the marketing team, and there's a bunch of them on this call, have done a shit ton of research. And they keep this information up to date. And then they give it to Rory, our amazing graphic designer. And he builds these beautiful images, but it's all white labeled and it's all up to date research. 
So if you're looking, you take the snapshot report that gives you the individual research points about the business, how they compare to the industry. But then you can use the content in that guides to craft email cadences, to work on your scripting when you're talking to the customers. Those are the very latest data points as to why you, know, you wanna deal with negative reviews or why you want to use Google Search Console or why, and the why is why the SME wants to use those things. So in that guides tab, there is a lot of great content in there that is 100% white labeled that you can repurpose for your organization's benefit. Thank you so much. Um, I'm specifically focused on tourism here in Puerto Rico. Um, so it's a uh, unique, a lot of my clients have our hotels and boutique owners. So, and Airbnb is where I focus at. And so it's been difficult kind of finding information around that. Um, so I can, you know, uh, make a package out of it. So I'll, I would definitely look into that in more detail. Thank you. Yeah. And I would recommend, here's the thing with tourism. Um, when you travel to a location, you're in San Juan. Yes, I am. So we go to San Juan, we get off the cruise ship and we want to go do some stuff. Maybe mm -hmm. I want to do some stuff. Maybe my wife wants to do some stuff. We have no clue what's there. The only way that we find something is on here. So for that business, they need to be on Google My Business and they need to rank for a near me search. And then they need to do some other crazy stuff like Wi-Fi. I'm going to make my buying decision on a restaurant kind of on the food, but also more on the Wi-Fi because I don't wanna pay my data overage charges on my mobile device. So you know what I want you to do is think about you as a tourist. Think about the last time you went to a location and then articulate a story like that. And really for that local business, they have to rank for me because I'm the tourist that they want to have come in. Got you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Awesome. We'll move over to Tony. Hey, just a little bit. Uh, oh, really thank you guys. So for putting what email do you use? Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you okay, well. Okay, great. The other one is the um, I've been a partner for a while. Created under that email. I think somebody's, there we go. Um, I've been a partner for a while and growth has been um, slow. We're great on delivery. And one thing that I started doing last year was really focusing on sales, which was sort of backwards from what I probably should have done years ago. Um, and I do find, a, you know, this is the snapshot report in the, in the, and all the resources are a gold mine for me uh, once I get in conversation with with leads. My my question is, what is your favorite uh, strategy for generating more leads um, as far as prospecting goes? Where we're running some ads, we're doing. Uh, I'm doing more prospecting. We're a small agency, so I'm the I'm I'm the sales guy right now. Yeah. So, you know, it's the age old story. I've never met a salesperson that said I have too many leads. I also have never met a salesperson who said you gave me too much commission this month ever. It's never happened. Um, so I, I think that we, we shouldn't overthink this though, because uh, you know, my question, and it was Tony, right? Yeah. Tony, uh, what is the average value of a customer to you? Like what's the lot, what do you get out of them every year on average right now with your customers? Uh, we have a couple different tiers uh, for maintenance clients. Uh, they're uh, about twelve hundred a year, and then for uh, new customers uh, that are we're doing web design. The lifetime value is five to ten thousand. And uh, the web design stuff is up and down like a toilet seat, and that's one of the things about web business. You, it's feast or famine. So right. what we want to do is try to even that stuff out and get it less lumpy. The good news is the business owner needs us every day. They don't just need us when they need a website. So what we want to do is build a foundational package that has value and also adds that value with a robot. This is why I like reputation management. This is why I like the daily digest. This is why I like the executive report. We go in and we talk to them about the value that those solutions offer and we charge a monthly fee for that. And then as we watch that data and, and you know we've got, done a lot of training around this, you want to go into those accounts pretty much every week and see if they got a review, see what people are saying about the business, because the comments that the consumers are making in reputation management, when we see a review leads us to the marketing strategy. They're like, we really like the salmon at this restaurant. You've got the best salmon. That's right in a positive review. I'm going to run an ad about our salmon. 
world-class salmon. Nakia says it is. Put a picture of Nakia and five stars that I got from that review. So the foundational products that we offer that map to the snapshot report, they have an enormous amount of value for the dollar that you charge. Don't try and make 5,000% margin on those. Try and make a realistic amount of margin, but what they're really there for is to give you intelligence about what's going on with that business. What are customers saying about that client? And then you can utilize that intel in your strategy call to come in and say, I noticed that customers are saying this. I noticed that your competitor is doing this. I noticed that there's an opportunity around these keywords. And then that forms the strategy for the, for the upsell where you're solving more of their problems, but you got to get your foot in the door. So what, you know, if, if I were you, and when I get fired, which is only a matter of time, I've been saying that for 10 years, I'm just going to start an agency. And the first place I'm going to go is to the chamber of commerce or to some business group or a real estate association or a mastermind. And I'm going to go to those customers and say, I'm going to give you a snapshot report and I'm going to turn on a toolkit free. My name's George. How do you like me so far? And then at the next meeting, I'm going to come back and start talking to those individual businesses with the data that I have from those tools. Right. They may not have logged into them. I don't care. I have them turned on and I'm able to see what's happening. And I have found even with customers that are paying us a lot of money every month, and by us, I mean a channel partner, we give them the login, we load it on their phone, we show them how to use it, we send them notifications. They still don't use the bloody thing. But a month or two down the road, I keep pushing them there. Use the tool, use the tool, use the tool, open the email, open the email, record Loom videos of you going through the executive report and sending it to them. And through those motions, you are building value with that customer using the toolkit. The other thing that I love about the online toolkit, you know, you guys have probably all heard this. You call on a prospect and they say this, I've got a guy or I've got a gal and they look after my digital marketing for me. But yet, when you really look at it, no, they post on Instagram or they update their website. They are not Bryce. And Bryce has been doing this for years. He is a digital marketing expert. He's coming in with a holistic view of their digital marketing strategy. You don't have a digital marketing expert. You got an Instagram poster. That's what you got. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to give the Instagram poster the toolkit. Because, you know, the thing that I like about people that are doing this work, if they get those tools, they have a better life. Now we have 170 people that do social posting through our marketing services team, and they use these tools every day. Without these tools, they wouldn't be able to do it at scale. So it would make sense that the I got a guy or the I got a gal would find value from these tools. But insert old salesperson like George, we don't like giving stuff away. We've been programmed. Why give it away? I'm like, no, it's 2022. Things have changed. So we want to offer that value. So what I, we've been testing this for about six months in real calls. This is not us living in a bubble. This is me on the street working with reps. And we get that objection, not an objection. I got a guy. And we go, awesome. Let's give the guy this. In fact, introduce me to the guy or the gal. Sit across the table, load the tools up on their machine and say, I just gave you some hours of your life back. And then we watch their engagement with those tools. If they use them, they connect their Google AdWords. They connect their Facebook account. You can start to see the way they're running the ad campaigns. You can start to see the way they're posting. And then you can come back in and say, I think there's some ways that I can help you improve your outcome. Mm -hmm. So get so them in the door with, yeah. Definitely. A few tactics, Tony, on, on how to don't be afraid to use the ammunition we've gave you in the toolkit to start to develop those leads into people that trust you. Okay, excellent answer. Thank you. Hey, George, can I add to that too? Make sure that that person, that guy or gal, is not threatened by you, that you're not there to take their job. You're there to make them look better. Great addition, Bryce. Yeah. Um, okay, we'll go to Chris McNamara and then Chris Cowan. Hey, that was great. Um, yeah, just as, I guess a sort of follow on from that, George. Um, if uh, if you're in with a snapshot report related um, sales process, what would you sort of recommend as far as breaking the ice on a cold call um, and having that sort of initial opening? Yeah, it's um, don't give them the whole thing. <laughs> uh, there's a lot there. It will overwhelm the prospect. 
Um, so you want to give them a piece and I want to find the piece that sucks the most. So you go through the snapshot report, look for the Fs. Fs are a good thing in this case. That's where the problem is. Um, so so I, run the report before the call? Oh, always. Okay. Always before the call. And when you're running the report, if you go back and take your snapshot ninja course, um, while you're running the report, you will see that there are things in there that it's telling you even while you're running the report. Um, and that will give you some insights. But the snapshot report is not a silver bullet. It doesn't make up data. That's the other thing. So sales reps will use it and they'll be like, oh, this thing's broken. Uh, but if snapshot found it, that means the customers can find it. And by customers, I mean consumers. There's a lot of bad data that's out there. So first off, please don't use the whole report. Use pieces of it. And find the, you, probably a business can handle two punches in the face. What I mean by that is you're going to say, your listings are broken. You got a bad reputation. You just punched them twice. I wouldn't swing the third time. I would wait and use that on the next call. So give them the two most important things that can help their business. I don't mind giving them a shot in the chops if I know I can help them. I, tell, I call it an attention grabber. Um, and then the second thing is, please don't ever use a snapshot report on a paying customer. So what I mean by that is if you've sold them a listing solution, a website, a social campaign, snapshot should not be used because the algorithm that we're using to create that fear of loss is harsh. And you've sold them a website. You don't want to give them an F for the thing that you sold. Now, you probably won't get an F, but you might get a C because they insist upon having that photo on their front page that's garbage. Yeah. So snapshot is to build fear of loss executive report is to show that it's working. Now, if you haven't sold them the website, yeah, send them the website portion of the snapshot report, but turn the other pieces off around listings and reputation and SEO, right? So snapshot never meets a paying customer on the thing that they bought. Use the executive report to show value and opportunity. So those two tools, snapshot is fear of loss. That's why it works so bloody well. Did that help? Yeah, great. Thank you. Great. Um, if there's time, could I just ask one more? Um, yeah, go for I'm it. I'm really bad at the, the telling story side of things. Um, I'm like a really bad raconteur. Um, any sort of tips around that? Yeah, we're going to send you a course that we do with every new sales rep at Vendasta called Giving Amazing Presentations. And uh, I'm gonna challenge you with four exercises in that course that'll make you a better storyteller. So the one that I like the best is Chris, hold up an inanimate object around you, like a stapler or a photocopier. Or, are you American? Well, you're not American. I can tell by your accent. Cause if you're American, you'd probably hold up a gun. Um, <laughs> but okay, you got that phone. Got the phone. Yeah. Now, one of the exercises is tell me a story as to how that phone came to be. And accuracy is not necessary. Um, the moral of the story is you get good at telling stories and not talking about it's got a five megapixel camera. It's got this nice little thing around it to make sure that I don't break it. Right. We get away from that technical teller feature stuff and we tell a story about how, you know, the smart Steve Jobs was working with his Blackberry and he was spinning that little dial. But he just had a peanut butter sandwich and the peanut butter got stuck in the ball. And Jobs is a pretty smart guy. And he said, you know, I think we could do a better job of this. What if the glass on the phone, I could just touch it rather than the stupid ball thing on the Blackberry that gets stuck with my peanut butter. And that's how the iPhone came to be. Not to mention the fact he had a whole bunch of parts from all the iPods that he was trying to get rid of. You know, I don't know if that, you see where I'm going with it? Yeah, yeah. It's more around a story and the outcome that Steve was trying to drive and build it. Now, there is nothing accurate about that story. But it gets you to the point of telling a story rather than talking about feature benefit. Cool. And Thank just you. to um, build on that a little bit, Chris, we've done a, a storytelling, a brand storytelling course in the community session that I can um, link out to you after as well that just might help you build on some of those techniques. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, okay, Chris Cowan asked in the chat, where did that go? Or Chris, do you want to unmute and, and ask? I'll, I'll ask, I'll, I'll read it. I found his comment. Um, some of this is building on off of a few of these questions. 
I'm trying to open more, more new business conversations. Is there a way you would recommend finding prospects to start? Are you building lists off of LinkedIn and doing outreach or just knocking on local doors? Or is there some other way partners are opening up new business? So George sort of touched on that with the chamber and other things. And I know our sales reps are now doing a, a social selling program. Um, George, do you want to touch on, on any of that anymore? Well, I, I do. And in- it's hard, right? Social selling is a very tough thing because it's tough to prove ROI. Um, just try explaining a social strategy to your SMB uh, and then try to show them ROI. But I will tell you that there are all sorts of data points that say that if we become our own content engine, we're able to build our personal brand. And one of the things that I like to train sales reps on, your personal brand is as important as the agency, media company, whatever your organization's brand is. You have to build a personal brand because it's easy for me to do research. I can I meet with a sales rep and I research them afterwards. I go to their LinkedIn profile. I see what their background is. I go, you know, if they have a personal website, I look at maybe some testimonials that they have. So the personal brand of a sales professional is as important as the corporate brand. Now, I'm working on a couple of deals right now with some enterprise customers and I'm stalking my buyers and I got about eight of them. And I'm following them on LinkedIn. And when they start posting things on LinkedIn, guess who's in there? George, like, share, commenting. What am I doing? I'm building the top of mind awareness that I have as a sales professional with that prospective buyer. So we can run ads. I can phone them. I can send emails. I can send gifts in the mail. I can courier swag to them. But where people are living right now is in their social streams. So it would make sense if they only have like 21 people that are liking their things and I'm trying to get my name recognition higher. If I like and share and leave a comment, they're like, oh, who's this guy with the hair and the jacket? And the and then they start looking up George and they find a blog and they find a LinkedIn profile and they find content and they find a podcast. So the social selling strategy, you need one for your company, but you need one yourself. Your personal brand has never been more important than it is today. In fact, I believe the personal brand of an individual contributor is more important than the corporate brand. Yeah. Um, Anyone have anything to add to that? I think that's great. It's all about building that trust. Like the panelists said, building that trust, having people get to know you first, engage in the communities where they are um, and, and find your people. I got. I could throw something on there really quick. I, That'd be great. Uh, uh, for, I've been in the real estate industry for over 30 years, or I was. I'm semi-retired from that. But one of the things that I did in one of my companies was I sent out a survey to my clients. Uh, this was back in the mid 90s, and I said, "So, what's the first name you think of when you think of a real estate company?" And at that time, Century 21 was the big thing. They ran around with gold jackets, and you know, I got all these responses and that, but I asked him the second question. I said, is it important to you what company your agent works for? And the resounding response was no, they didn't really care. Yeah. Even though the name recognition of the brand was there, they wanted the, uh, the feeling of trust, knowledge and uh, experience of the agent, not the brand. So just want to throw that in. No, you're 100% right. And I I really believe that. I think people buy from people. And um, while the organization's trust is very important, it's more around the individual. So we want to deploy those social selling strategies. Like, just think about it on LinkedIn. If some individual was liking your stuff on LinkedIn and they shared your post, imagine the dopamine hit you're going to get from that. And then number two, you're probably going to remember their name. So why wouldn't we start deploying that? Like I find when I go to do a presentation, the people that I'm presenting to have already checked me out on LinkedIn. I can see it on the profile ahead of time. That is the new digital business card. Yeah, that's and that's a great anecdote, Patrick. And sometimes it can work the opposite way as well, where, where the brand or the, the company sort of takes precedence. I think particularly in politics, people are usually voting for, a party rather than a person, but building your personal brand for, for sales is huge. Um, we have time for a couple more questions before we go on. I just want to 
remind everyone about the local impact awards that are launched today. So now you can nominate yourself. All the categories are online. Katrina, do you want to say a little bit more about that? Katrina is the mastermind behind both connect and the, and the lo local impact awards. <laughs> Thanks, Nikia. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Yeah, so the Local Impact Awards, um, we have six categories. Uh, applications are open now through to May 31st. We have um, categories like uh, Client Success Award, Partner of the Year, Vendor of the Year, Innovation, um, Conquer Local Ambassador, and our last one was a is um strategy and excellence in strategy award <laughs> so you can we'll share the link again um in the chat here if you have any questions give me a shout or you can um email marketing at vendasta.com so we really want to um just honor and celebrate all the companies out there helping local local businesses our partners and vendors and, and it's open to any company um yeah, so we look forward to getting applications and hearing all the great stories that come through. And yes, stay around for a swag prize at the end. Yeah. <laughs> what else was I supposed to say? No, I was, Love it. Do we are we also um no thanks Katrina, that's great. And are we also doing the <laughs> post event survey? Or are we sending that out? Post event survey. Yes. I Put have a link for the post event survey. I think Brett has it. Um, and also I'll be sending out an email with the link to that, the awards um, page and how to get access to Proposal Builder. So you'll Thanks, get that Katrina. later today. <laughs> okay. Thanks and everyone. Just so you guys know, those post-event surveys, we pour over them. Like we, everyone <laughs> reads those. It's like when a review comes into Vendasta, when a net promoter score comes in, we all look at it. We all read. There's nothing more valuable. No one's insights more important than, than hearing from you guys. So it's really valuable if you fill that out for us. Um, does anyone have another question? We have time for maybe one more before Katrina spins the wheel of prize. It's probably got a yeah. different answer. <clears throat> I've got a question. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, go for it, Robert. We'll go Robert and Tim, and then we'll spin. Robert, where's Robert? But Robert, you're Robert, you're muted. Am I? Sorry, no, I, I don't have a question. Sorry, I don't. That's unusual. Oh, I better get in quickly then. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Well, w one thing. Um, yeah, I'm going to win an award, uh, and uh, I don't know if this was answered because I came in late, but um, George, do you have uh, standard operating procedures when onboarding uh, clients with the toolkit? Yeah, um, absolutely I do. Don't let them do it on their own. Get on the phone and help them through. Show them how to do it. Pop a browser. Show your screen share. Educate them. Um, you, you want to get the customer talking, take them through a toolkit, ask them questions. Do you have a Google, my business profile? Nope, I don't. Well, let me show you what that looks like. Let me show you how to set that up. And that hard work, you are building so much trust and rapport a couple of seconds at a time. Every time you show them some items and you make a magic moment happen, their trust in you as an organization goes up. There is so much fake news out there right now in digital marketing. The people who come in as a trusted local expert and add value are the ones that are going to win. So it used to be a land grab where it's just like run around and get some business. Now people kind of have an idea of this, but they're being lied to a lot. There is a lot of fake news out there and there's a lot of vaporware. There are very few organizations that will take the time to help a customer find success. So that is uh, some of the, the tips on the toolkit is I like give a toolkit to everybody, but work with them to help them find value from it. Now, while you're working with that customer, if you realize that this customer is never going to turn into an ideal customer for my organization that will help me feed my kids, then you move them to a DIY and you leave them on the tool and maybe things change. So also in that time when you're working with them on the toolkit, you can decide if they're tall enough to ride the ride. 
And, and I find that we're, you know, we're out there and we're like, I want all the business. Actually, you don't want all the business. Trust me, I've been doing this for 35 years. There are customers that will suck the life out of you. Yeah. So by using the toolkit, you can kind of deposit them over there and see if they'll take the steps. You give them some homework. And then when you get back with them on the next call, you go, how did the homework go? And they go, oh, I didn't have time to do that. You're like, okay, well, when you do the homework, give me a call and I'll take you to the next steps. So you kind of put it on, because it's, it's a, they've got to work with you, right? Do it yourself is lead gen. You give them a tool, you watch it, see what they do. And then you go in and you help them with other problems. That's, I truly believe that. Mm. Digital marketing solutions are not bought, they're sold. And that's good for us on this call because we all have jobs. The day that they're bought, when I can go to a robot and just buy this stuff, we're going to have to find something else to do, right? So there's an enormous opportunity to be that trusted local expert and to help them navigate the space. You'll hear me say over and over again, we're not salespeople. We're tour guides. But we do ask for business. So yes, we are salespeople. I've seen a lot of people that are great tour guides that never ask for business or the upsell. So you still have to be a salesperson, but me more of a tour guide and take them through. And you're vetting them as much as they're vetting you, that actually gives you a little bit of power in the, in the conversation. Yeah. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for asking, Tim. Okay, we'll squeeze in one more quick question before we spin the wheel. Jay. Hey, thanks for hosting this, guys. Very informative. My question here is, what would you, what would um, you recommend or what best practices would you suggest to someone prospecting businesses that earn 10 to $15 million gross per year? Hmm. Bring, uh, bring a lot of data a lot and of data. look for multiple buyers because there's going to be a committee that makes the decision. Also at 10 to $15 million in revenue, you're probably going to have a technical buyer. So you're going to have to have a technical story as to how this stuff all works. The last thing in a company that size that a CTO or a chief information officer is going to want is another set of technology bolted onto about 500 other subscriptions they're trying to dial in. So, you know, in larger organizations, you're going to have multiple stakeholders at the table. You're going to have a person maybe that buys it, but you'll have other people that use it. And you're going to have to win them all over because if the person buys it and then the people don't use it, you won't get the renewal. Got it. Got it. Right. So those are just a few items. Like it is a more complex sale, probably more value. You can ask for more money, probably a lot more competition in there. Okay. Sounds good. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks for asking that, Jay. And thanks everyone for asking and attending. It's it's really awesome to engage in these sessions with you guys. Um, Katrina, do you want to spin the wheel? So while, while yes. we've been talking, Katrina's put everyone's names in for a Vendasta swag bag. And she, I don't know, it's sort of a novelty spinning this wheel. Okay. I, I hope I have it right now and I have everyone's name in there. I've been <laughs> typing and counting as I go. Okay, are we ready? Go. <laughs> Whoa, Jay. Oh, Jay. <laughs> Yay, Jay. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Look at that technology. <laughs> yeah. Jay, um, I'll probably have your email address, but you can also email me here as well and we'll send you on the swag bag. Perfect. Perfect. Jay, well, yeah, that was good timing. Jay asked the last question and then won the swag bag. And it was Love not it. rigged. It's definitely <laughs> not. <laughs> um, I, I appreciate it and I uh, can't wait to getting the swag bag and, and going through all of the goodies. Thanks, Jay. Um, okay, and thank you all for joining. I hope you got something out of it. Please fill out the uh, post event survey and apply for those local impact awards. Well, yeah, we're going to announce the winner at our next um, Conquer Local Connect, which will be in June. So get your applications in. Thank you all. Can you can you nominate another partner? Yeah, um, yeah I guess you, you could. You can yeah, if you fill have... in the application for them. Definitely. If you want to send me an email, we can figure that out. <laughs> yeah, like if you knew that there was a partner that can, you know, 
brought a lot of value to some of the other community calls and you want to mm -hmm. let them know you appreciate them, that kind of thing? Uh -huh. Yes, for the Conquer Local Awards. Yeah, I think that we can make that happen. That's an awesome question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a question. I just want to uh, more or less, uh, I want to ask, well, maybe it's a question. I'm sorry, George. I know you, you got to run. What do you think about, or what do you think about positioning an agency as the, as the answer to a business that is posting on a job message board, like, you know, monster or whatever else looking for a, you know, digital advertising specialist or a, I'm looking on, I'm on monster right now. I see paid search and digital advertising manager, growth, ma growth marketing manager, paid social. Um, and you know, marketing manager, marketing manager in the job descriptions match, you know, what we do, um, both within core Unlimited and, you know, I have some other partners and I look at these salaries and particularly I'm looking at one here for a, um, job. The salary is, uh, between 50 and $60,000 a year. Yeah. So, if I came in and said, well, you're, you're offering $60,000 a year, that's, you know, a little less than 6,000, it's 5,000 a month in ad spend. My agency can come in, run this for you. And that, and that right there, that's, that's, that's their, that's their budget. Forget, don't worry about paying me a salary. Here's the budget. Yeah. So here's the way Thoughts. I feel about this. And, and I'd love, why don't you test this? <laughs> um, I've got I a couple agree. other people that are testing this as well. They're prepared to pay 60 grand. So five grand a month to an employee to do this work. Pay you five grand a month and you will give them all the tactics at cost. So this is why you got to test it, right? Because it flips the model on its head. You're not going to charge every individual package with a markup. You're going to get paid a fee to do the work. But also you bring along all the tactics and rather having to mark it up, you give it to them at cost. And, and that's what you sell them on. Because if they hire that person, they're still gonna have to find the tactics. They're still gonna have to buy the inventory. They're still gonna have to get some things, right? Because a, that marketing manager is building the strategy and maybe doing a little bit of the work. They're still gonna have to go spend money over and above that. So my in the back of my mind, Robert, what I'm thinking of is, imagine if you just had 10 and you give them two days a month, you're their outsourced CMO, CRO. You go in, you help them build all the pipes and everything. Mm -hmm. And they pay you a wage to do the work. But what you bring along is the marketplace with the products and services at cost where you're not going to charge a markup on them. I, I've been thinking about this for about a year that maybe there is something there. <laughs> all right. Thanks, man. I can see Tim. He's got the Edmonton Ponder going right there. I, I know that look. <laughs> He's like, shit, why didn't he tell me about that? Because <laughs> it's just, it's mad scientist shit. It's just going on up here and that thing's a bag of cats. Yeah. Ask Brett, the producer of the podcast. He knows. Yes, yes. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Thank you very, very much. Thanks for asking. Good comment, Robert. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, have a great day, everyone. Care, Thanks everyone. for joining. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. I'll see you when I see Bye. you.